What's up, guys? It's time to do a top 10 horror list for one of the best years in cinema history. Wait, what? Are, are you telling me that this wasn't one of the best years in cinema? A pandemic? You got to be kidding me. We actually had a pandemic this year? Are you hearing this? A freaking pandemic. That's That hasn't happened in like 100 years, but this it happened this year. And so it's going to affect... The, the amount of movies that I can actually watch for the past year. I'd rather just review 10 to Midnight then. Damn. All right, well, let's do it. Uh, the top 10 best horror movies for 2020. Jesus freaking Christ. What is up, guys? 2020 is Pretty much in the can, all but gone. So it's time to do our end of year list. I'm just gonna do three this year. I'm gonna do top 10 best horror and top 10 worst horror, okay? And when I get to worst horror, I got some splaining to do on that one, okay? Because I didn't see a lot of really, really, really bad horror movies. I'd say the bottom five of that list is gonna be stinkers, but you'll see once we get there, okay? But first, we gotta do the best. There's plenty of good horror movies this year, thankfully, and it's nice that we have a lot of independent fare and less bigger budget type stuff because theaters weren't really open that much this year. A, a, a select few movies actually came to theaters. We all know this, okay? I'm wasting your time. But also I'm gonna be doing a, a non-horror ranking list because I literally only saw like 10 or 11 non-horror movies, like 2020 movies this year, okay? I'm not proud of it, so I figured I'll just do a ranking for those. But anyway, let's jump right into it. I'm going to give you two honorable mentions for this list, okay? First honorable mention is going to be The Babysitter, Killer Queen. The sequel to The Babysitter. This movie was a lot of fun, actually. And there was some heavy stuff this year. So it's nice to kind of uh, throw in some, some fun horror movies. And I had a blast with this one, actually. And I was surprised because I didn't think it was going to be that great, considering without going into any spoilers because there will be no spoilers on this list. Um, Samara Weaving wasn't advertised as front and center in this. This was more Cole's movie. But Cole was a great leading man for this, or kid, I guess. He's a teenager, late teens. And uh, I liked all the characters in this. You had the returning, uh, I get, what would you call them, like demons or whatever they were? This movie was just a great comedy horror movie. It was a fun-ass ride, and I, I had a blast with it. Next honorable mention is going to be a movie I literally just reviewed called Alone. I'm so glad that I finally saw this movie. Big shout-out to Jason Mongold for cluing me in on this one. Uh, I had seen the trailer before, and I thought it was just going to be your standard uh, survival-type story, a, you know, kidnapper-type fare, but it worked out to be surprisingly very well done because of the two central characters and the fact that the the prey she made pretty much all the right decisions along the way and it was just a case of you can still do the right thing but you can still get caught you know you can still get apprehended and that's a big part of this movie and i would say one of the best endings of the entire year for me the the ending of this movie i was just fist pumping i was so happy. I was rooting for this character and I loved how it all unfolded. Okay, getting into the top 10. Number 10 is Host. This surprised me because I'm not the biggest fan of the, the laptop horror subgenre, but as long as you, you come with a good story, then it doesn't matter the subgenre that you use. I think the subtlety in this movie worked well for it because, you know, you're always looking behind the person that's in front of the laptop to see what's going to pop out. And I think just that tension without something actually popping out is what made it somewhat terrifying. And it worked very well. Also, this is like one of the shortest like feature-length horror movies I've ever seen. I think it's just, just under an hour long. And so it zips right by. Uh, and you can have hour-long like TV shows that take forever, that drag. But this one, you know, they, they came with a good story and they strategically placed the scares at the perfect spots along the way. Number nine, Underwater. Another big surprise for me too because I am hit and miss with Kristen Stewart. And I, I will say, I don't think Kristen Stewart's the best actress, but I think her skill set worked beautifully for this movie actually. 
And it's one of those movies that really delivered in the end because this is an underwater creature feature. And if you satisfy me in that genre and you give me a creature that is like, you know, larger than life and, and you know, just scary as hell, you know, fit this in like the Godzilla type realm, you know? Payoff. This movie had a lot of payoff in that category and I love the hell out of it. You know, I love a movie that starts off good, but then by the end of the movie, you're like, oh wow, I didn't expect that. You know, and I walked out of the theater just freaking loving this. Number eight, another newer movie that I saw not too long ago, Run. And really there's two central characters in this, played by Sarah Pauly and Kira Allen. This is pretty much a misery type of movie. You know, uh, a person held captive, uh, in this case, in their own house, and she happens to be in, in a wheelchair. And so her mother has a screw loose, and, and you know, she's trying to literally escape from her mother. And it's just ironic that the movie's called Run when it's a person in a wheelchair, but you'll get the point of the movie uh, if you watch it. But just nail biting. Very gripping, great little thriller, and uh, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Number seven, Color Out of Space. This probably is one of the most surprising movies of the year for me. And when I went into it, I didn't know that Richard Stanley directed this movie. And if you go and look at Richard Stanley's past with The Islands of Dr. Moreau, um, that alone will get you intrigued because this is a very eccentric filmmaker, but very talented actually. But I think back when he did Island of Dr. Moreau, he was so far ahead of his time and he was so young and he didn't know how to deal with the Hollywood machine. So finally, he gets to come back and do this movie, Color Out of Space, and it's just a visual beast, you know? This is... Uh, one of the few movies on this countdown that just, it, it might be the most beautiful movie out of the bunch. You know, there's just a lot to offer uh, in terms of like visual eye candy. But don't let that fool you because there's some gruesome practical effects in this movie as well. And it's just a great little science fiction flick too because one thing I love about science fiction is the unknown. You know, you can go into this story and you don't know where it's going to take you. And what they do with some of the characters in this movie physically is just jaw-dropping. Uh, mad thing vibes, and that's all I'll say, but loved Color Out of Space. Oh, and Nicolas Cage. Did I mention Nicolas Cage is in this? That's awesome. Number six, The Hunt. This was, I think, the last movie that came to theaters before COVID really kicked into high gear. And I remember going to see it, and then right after going to see it, going out and trying to find toilet paper. That was the beginning of the end, I guess. But uh, luckily, the movie was fun as hell. And Betty Gilpin from one of my favorite shows, Glow, she I guess she glowed in this movie because she was such a badass. I love a badass female character anyway. And boy, did she fit that mold. She was just so fun. She had that southern draw along the way. Uh, there's a, quite a few surprises in the way that she handles a lot of the characters throughout the movie, a lot of her interactions. But to me, she was the scene stiller, and, and luckily she's the main character of the movie, but she was amazing, and I loved how smart she was, and, and she was a great fighter, you know? She just encompassed everything you want in a badass female character. But she's funny as hell, too. Number five, Freaky. Um, Christopher Landon, I'm glad that he, I guess, listened to a lot of the criticisms from people like me for Happy Death Day. Happy Death Day has its fans, don't get me wrong. Jessica Roth is awesome in that role. I just had a, a major problem in the horror department with that, in the blood and guts department. Um, they got it right in Freaky. I mean, uh, Freaky really flips it, and there are kills that are just like slasher goodness, you know? Just creativity in terms of how far they're willing to go with the kills, and just bloody as hell. But it's also just a fun movie because it's a body swap movie mixed with a slasher genre. So what do you get when you put those two together? Uh, it's irresistible. And then you got Vince Vaughn in there, which is like comedic genius. So I just think they had all their ducks in a row uh, to make just such an entertaining, fun little flick. Number four, Invisible Man. Lee Whannell really cemented himself as, as a viable horror director. Sure, he's done a few movies before this, but this was like, a-level, top-tier stuff. You know, this is what horror fans like to see from time to time because it's just good for the business, you know? And it happens to be a fantastic film. Elizabeth Moss is great in the role. Uh, you really felt for her throughout. You know, she's trying to get away from this abusive relationship. 
uh, who happens to be invisible. He's using like invisible technology. Um, I like what they did kind of uh, fitting it into the modern world in terms of technology. That was kind of interesting. And you know, it's always fun just having an invisible character in a movie because you, you know, you, you can play around with that. Uh, and there's like a scene in there where they throw like paint on him. And it's just dazzling. It's just visually interesting. But it's a nail-biting thriller as well. Number three, Possessor. This might be the biggest mind F movie uh, of the year. It probably is. And it's Brandon Cronenberg, David Cronenberg's son. The apple does not fall far from the tree at all. Another one of those just visual feasts of a horror film. Uh, but really, I love the plot of this too. How you have this person working for this company and she goes into the body of another person. Uh, and there's just a lot of crazy shit that happens along the way. And it's violent as hell too. As a matter of fact, when, when I went and seen it in the theater, the, the manager like warned me like, are you sure you want to see this? Because this is like, a, I guess an unrated version of the movie shown in the theater. And I was like, I got this. And I got a chuckle out of that too. Do you know who you're talking to? Number two, The Lodge. Uh, this I think came out like really early in the year, like January. Some uh, Is it a, technically a 2019 movie? I'm not sure, it might be, but it's on my list, okay? Because by the time I did my list last year, I didn't see it. But The Lodge, it's one of those like winter snow type films. Uh, and you have this woman that's kind of the outsider to this family. Uh, because the family is broken up and so these kids are forced to stay with this woman that is not stable and so a lot of crazy psychological type things happen along the way it's a dark movie uh, you know you can fit this in the realm of films like the witch and hereditary not the exact same uh, subgenre but it just has that vibe almost kind of a quietness to the movie and also this movie has probably one of the biggest shock scenes of the year, easily. And if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, number one, this is the movie that's going to get a lot of controversy from you guys. It is The Rental. And I am so glad that I got to put this at number one. This movie, for some reason, caught so much flack. And I think I know the reason why. I think it's because it doesn't fit the norm of what you would expect these types of films to do. It's a patient movie, actually, and you have to stay with it. Uh, it it's not the type of movie that every 15 minutes you're gonna get a kill and some, you know, some blood thrown at the screen. No, this is definitely a slow burn psychological film just about these group of friends that go to this like rental, you know, kind of like an Airbnb. This is like an Airbnb horror movie. And they think that somebody is spying on them easily one of the most satisfying last acts of the year. Uh, I was just completely floored by where this movie went. And I didn't predict where it was going to go, but when it happened, I was just like, oh my God, that, that was genius. That was amazing. And this was Dave Franco's uh, directorial debut, I think. And I think he is a great horror director, you know? Knows how to handle tension. Uh, and, and just a visually beautiful movie too, actually. But... Uh, Gonna get some controversy for, for that one, but it's been my number one ever since I saw it. Nothing has topped it. It's a movie that just stayed with me and I could not get it out of my head. So anyway, guys, that's my top 10 for 2020. Some good movies in there, actually, so I can't complain. Let me know your favorites below. You, I guarantee you, your top 10 is not gonna be the same as my top 10, okay? Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks where we talk horror all day and every day on Fridays. We do Free Fall Fridays. Follow my drum dumbs on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and drum them out.